have a lot to talk about. So, um, good morning, everyone, and, and any keen beans who are watching online, wherever you are. Um, very uh, warm welcome to uh, my first police scrutiny, uh, police commissioner scrutiny meeting. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, um, so I'm Emily. I'm the new uh, police crime commissioner for Merseyside, um, and one of my key roles is to um, hold the police to account via uh, the chief constable. Um, now, as the police commissioner. Uh, I don't have any responsibility for anything operational. It's important that I don't interfere with any kind of specific operational decisions. But what I do do is look at um, the patterns, look at the data, um, ask some questions of, of the Chief Constable and her team, um, and look at how we can make sure that we're kind of constantly offering that challenge to make sure that um, the public are getting the best service. Um, so that's what we're doing here today. So this is the first one. Um, we are live streaming them today in a new um, approach. So hopefully, if anybody is watching, um, I hope you find it useful. Um, and a chance to see um, the work of the Chief and her team. Um, we also invited some public questions this time, so a big thank you to everybody who submitted their questions. We will be um, asking them as we go through uh, the meeting today. Um, there were a few as well that weren't relevant for this meeting, but we will hold on to them for future meetings as well. Um, but a big thank you to everybody who submitted their questions. Um, uh, you'll also notice today, for anybody who has um, read meetings or, or seen previous um, uh, scrutiny meetings of the police. We are doing a thematic approach now. Um, so today we are focusing on the workforce. So we're very much talking about um, the people, so the police, uh, the officers, the staff, the diversity, um, their well-being, how have they kind of managed through the pandemic, um, looking at all of those um, issues around kind of people, uh, which are obviously are kind of key uh, to um, getting good service from Merseyside Police. So we're focusing on that issue today. Um, we have got a couple of apologies for absence and then I think we'll um, are we okay to do um, introductions? Will the camera pick people up? Yeah. Um, okay, so we've got two apologies from Ian Critchley, the Deputy Chief Constable, and also Natalie Perashini, who is our Head of Corporate Support and Development. Um, so if we just go around and do introductions for um, anybody watching. Um, so I've said I'm Emily, I'm the Police Commissioner. Clive. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, all. I'm Clive Howarth. I'm the Commissioner's Chief Executive. Kim Dawson from the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner. Good morning, uh, Matt Boyle. I'm the Temporary Assistant Chief Constable uh, leading People Services. Good morning, I'm Joanna Sloney, um, Business Support Officer, Merseyside Police. Serena Kennedy, I'm the Chief Constable. Good morning, everyone. I'm Louise Kane, Head of Performance and Analytics at Merseyside Police. Good morning, Bob Carden, ACC Response and Resolution. Morning, I'm Nari Wayne, Temporary ACC in charge of Investigation and Intelligence. Good morning, John Roy, uh, Assistant Chief Constable responsible for local policing, preventative policing and criminal justice. Good morning, Keith Dickinson, Director of Resources. Hi, good morning, John Riley, a Chief Finance Officer for the Police and Crime Commissioner. Jenny Pennyfold, Head of Employee Relations. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much for that. If we move on now then to the minutes of the last meeting. So the last meeting was um, a bit different from usual because it was a bit of an introduction for myself um, to see where the um, uh, police were up to with various issues. Um, are there any um, amendments, any uh, inaccuracies, anything anyone wants to flag up from the minutes? No? Okay, great. So we'll uh, approve them and there were no actions um, arising from that, arising from that, so we will um, move on. Okay, so as I say, the um, theme for this meeting is around workforce and people, so we're going to start looking at the establishment first, so I'll hand over to um, the Chief. Sorry, um, it's like COVID and saying I'm on mute. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you for that. Um, so in terms of establishment, I suppose uh, the overarching thing I would say is it's a positive picture for us. Obviously, since 2010, uh, Merseyside has suffered cuts, uh, and which has impacted on our officer numbers uh, and our police staff numbers. But with Operation Uplift, we are seeing an, an improving position. And we will, um, by the end of 2022, uh, be up to police officer numbers um, around where we were in 2011. So in quite a positive picture um, for our communities and also increasing levels of police staff. So that's the overarching position. 
Um, Louise, I'll just hand over to you in just, just terms of walking us through the slides. The way we're going to do it, just for the public's information, is we will, Louise will introduce the slides and then where it is relevant to the different chief offices, we will then give you the, the, the narrative around those, uh, around those slides. Thanks, Chief. Um, so the slide shows uh, the establishment of police officers and police staff. Um, from the left-hand side, the budget is FTA 6507.64. And then the middle uh, graph shows the uh, people versus the FTA versus headcount and vacancies at 102.71. Thanks, Louise. Um, Commissioner, as the Chief Constable has said, we're in a very positive position regarding our workforce. Uh, we've made the uh, best use of the budget uh, in achieving a higher head count um, than the budgeted full-time employed numbers. Um, we are obviously operating against the Home Office Operation Uplift uh, targets uh, as part of the 20,000 additional police officers. Uh, we are ahead of our position uh, and we currently have over 200 student officers uh, who are currently completing their training in addition. Um, that all takes into account um, some attrition rates and I will discuss that later on, uh, retirements and the development of the workforce. I'll go through the section and then I'll ask stuff as we go at the end, is that is that right? Yeah. I think so. Is um, around the uh, PCSOs, uh, current establishment of two four nine against the uh, uh, FTA of one nine eight. Uh, the current vacancy level is at fifty one. Uh, there's further three PCSOs intakes, uh, creating sixty seven plan spaces. Uh, in November, January and March uh, and then obviously that ongoing recruitment campaign uh, to, to attract candidates from the wild, wisest pool we can do. We've then got again police officer vacancy overview. So uh, we talk about here the uh, forces a significant number of student officers at various stages in their journey. Um, and once they will be signed off, they'll be posted to the vacancies across the force. Um, we have some, um, we've shared some data around where those vacancies have gone across the local policing areas. Um, and over the coming months, we've got 200 student officers that will complete the training, uh, which will be po posted as, as the PCSOs will to vacancies and fill specialist roles. Um, the student officers at the independent patrol stage of the training are aligned to core operational strands, particularly uh, response and resolution, local policing and investigation, and that particularly makes sure that they gain that experience um, and develop in the right way, building those skills, and then are able to be deployed further into the force to other um, vacancies and substantive teams. So just on that then, do you know where... The, you said you've already shared with us the, where the different um, areas of vacancies are. Is that, is that in these packs or are you going to... Oh, is that in the previous one? Can you just highlight roughly where I think some of the vacancies are for the public's benefit? So we know we've got vacancies... Sorry, microphone. So we know we've got vacancies across each of the core operational strands, but what we have got, as Louise said, is we've got student offices who, not, who are not signed off for independent patrol allocated to those particular strands so whilst it shows as a vacancy uh, what you've actually got is it is a student officer sitting within those strands so actually a number of our key core operational strands are actually over establishment but it's because the student officers are shown as aligned to people services whilst they're going through their student officer phase which because of the new degree apprenticeship is for a three-year period but it effectively kind of we have got a small vacancy factor. We always have a vacancy factor because of the attrition through um, retirements, secondments, people leaving the organisation whilst we've got the pipeline coming in. But actually, we only have a very small vacancy factor because of the number of the number of vacancies that we that we have. Uh, but and, and those vacancies are, are held across our key operational mm -hmm. policing strands. Matt, I don't think there's anything different to that, is there? 
Uh, just, just in addition to that, Chief, um, we do then have a robust governance process in place that looks at future uh, attrition, and then once those officers complete their student um, uh, periods, then we allocate them to their substantive post and matching against the, the, the vacancies that we have. Okay, so this uh, graphic shows um, the overview by rank of the retirement eligibility for police officers for the three-year period. Across that period, there are a total of 266 officers that will be eligible to retire, and that falls, forms part of workforce planning and the forecasted future requirements. Um, it just of note, the projected requirements do not affect the plan's uh, growth, uplift growth. Uh, which is in addition to natural attrition planning and is therefore factored into the annual total recruitment numbers uh, accordingly. So just on the attrition planning then, is it, is it just that if you know you've got, you know, 30 people due to retire, you make sure you've got 30 people additional ready to be trained and come in, so you, you're kind of, it's, it's, it's that simple. There's nothing more complicated than you've got 30 people retiring, you know, you need 30 people in place ready to take over to a sec. So through the strategic workforce uh, management group, the, the planning for the attrition, what we, lo what we look at is we go back over five years, we look at our retirement rates, we look at our promotion rates, and we look at our secondment rates, so secondment into our, our regional organised crime unit and our um, secondments into the, the, our regional counter terrorism unit, and then a small percentage of, uh, of secondments into national roles. What that able, enables us to do is forecast forward. So, basing it on five years' worth of data, how many constables got promoted to um, to sergeants, about how many vacancies. So then, that allows us to forecast over kind of three years ahead what our normal recruitment would look like for officers. And that has tended over the past five years to be around one, between 120 and 160. On top of that, we've obviously got the operation uplift, which is 660 over a three and a half year period, which as Matt said, we've gone early on, which is why we're seeing the high volumes of student offices. So it's not just the retirements, we have to look at the secondments and the promotions, otherwise we won't be recruiting, uh, re recruiting enough but we've got the analytical capability to do that forecasting. And, and the other point to note on that is, we are still forecasting on a 30 year uh, retirement age, and actually with the changes to the pe pension regulations, we're, we're now at the point where we're probably over the next 12 months, we will see a difference in uh, people's decisions as to when to go, because they might not be eligible to go with 30 years servicing because of the changes to the pension. So it's going to, it is going to be a little bit different to what that five-year picture looking back is going to give us. Okay, so this slide shows the central staffing budget. Year-to-date budget to June 2021 is 99.1 million. Uh, Year-to-date underspend is uh, to June is 0.1 million. That's equivalent of 0.1% of the year-to-date staffing budget. Uh, there's also an underspend of 0.3 million on the total uplift budget at the end of June, although that includes both staff and non-staff costs. Okay, so this slide shows the establishment and the attrition patterns, um, projection versus reality. So the projection is uh, the yellow trend line and the red is the actual. Uh, so for police officers, uh, we, as, as the Chief says, undertake work to forecast potential attrition levels. Uh, the attrition during 2020-21 was lower than predicted, and we do think that that's obviously largely due to the pandemic um, and a national trends across all industry. Uh, the forecast for 2021-22 is complex with uh, lots of unknown factors linked to post-COVID recovery. And again, uh, industry expectation of high likelihood of attrition spike uh, during 2021-22. Uh, April to June projected 33 police officer leavers, but in reality that was 50. And the dynamic profile of attrition in line with emerging patterns and ongoing evaluation against the related plans are in place. For PCSOs, uh, similar issues as I've just mentioned, um, we are obviously uh, 
planning and forecasts the nutrition levels uh, for to aid planning processes. Uh, the attrition during 2020-21 was lower than predicted and again we do believe that's largely due to pandemic and again a national trend against all industries. Uh, April to June projected six levers but in reality there was 12. Of those 12, five of those PCSAs have become um, police officers and again we do uh, undertake dynamic profiling of that attrition line uh, and it is ongoing evaluation to make sure that our planning is in place. So do we know where the police officers are going to and what kind of things they're leaving for? Yes, um, so obviously there's, there's retirements, which is a natural uh, progression. Obviously a police officer can retire after the 30 years under the old scheme. Uh, there's no requirements as long as they are under the mandatory age. So we are seeing increases in retirements. Uh, within that as well, we have some uh, student officers that, um, uh, and I was in the presentation later on, uh, who are also leaving the organisation and we, we're fully aware of the reasons why. Uh, the attrition pattern, I've done it. Um, okay, so the attrition was lower than predicted uh, again, and again reflects uh, national patterns. Uh, the forecasting um, is difficult for us, but we do uh, expect a high likelihood of attrition during 21 22. Uh, the April to June projected 42 levers, and in rea reality, there were 67, and again, we dynamically assess this as we go along. So in terms of why there was lower attrition last year, it, do we think, it, is it, do we know why? Is it because people wanted to maybe delay retirement because they wanted to stay in and help support the pandemic? Or was it that, I don't know, there weren't other jobs available, so they stayed on for a little bit longer? Do you have any sense of why people didn't leave last year? I think it was, was a, I don't think there's any one single factor um, in terms of what, uh, as Louise has said, in terms of the, we are following a national trend. So during COVID, I think people, um, certainly from the public sector, wanted to be involved in, in providing that service to our communities. So policing through, through COVID, there was definitely that um, want of our staff to be involved. I think the ability for people to work flexibly enabled uh, people to uh, remain working when perhaps they may have considered retiring. Um, I think as we come out of COVID, I think it's made people consider um, what they want in terms of their working life. Um, so you're seeing people um, reti retiring uh, now when they may, they may have stayed uh, working because they've actually, you know, working flexibly provided them with a solution which enabled them to work slightly longer but they've but they've gone now so I don't think there's any one single factor I think what's playing out in policing is what's playing out in in, in, in industry nationally and as you say the job market is is lifting again so that opportunity to, to, to go elsewhere if people did want to change a career yeah interesting thanks Um, so there was one other question that we had from um, the public um, who was asking around, obviously we're getting a lot of, and we'll probably come on to talk about this in terms of the new recruits, but um, we are going to have a lot of young in service um, officers um, who might potentially not have the experience and obviously we're losing, you know, through retirement and things, a lot of more um, experienced and older officers. Um, how are you kind of going to manage that, I think, as a, as a force? Yeah, we were acutely aware of that. Uh, we In policing, we've always, always had a, an element of younger uh, officers um, who come in uh, through recruitment. Um, we have uh, explained um, up to now uh, about the carousel that we do, where we expose them to different parts of policing, uh, response and resolution, local policing teams and investigations. Um, We've increased the uh, training that we provide to our tutor constables. So each student officer, when they've completed their initial training, will be allocated a single tutor constable. They have additional training, additional support. We've invested in our professional development unit, which is a core group of people at uh, our academy, 
who become specialists in providing that ongoing assessment and support, not only to the student, but also to the tutor constable. Um, and I'll give you a, a very basic example. Recently, we've also uh, been conducting uh, webinars on a weekly basis for tutor and student officer as well to uh, identify any extra learning or support we can put in place. So we're doing lots of activity providing the support uh, and remaining completely engaged with our young workforce. Um, and then in terms of um, uh, losing some of the experienced officers, so particularly around chief officers who are due for retirement, have you got work in place to make sure that you've got people ready to kind of move up through the ranks and take on some of those leadership roles? So what I would say around the chief officers being eligible for retirement, that's based on the, um, the pension age being a 30-year service and most of the chief officers are now on to the new pension scheme. So whilst it shows that a number of us are eligible for retirement in, 30, in, in, in the next couple of years, that is based on the old pension. Um, so a number of us aren't eligible for retirement in, in two years' time because of that. And yes, we are investing um, the leadership framework, which sits under the people strategy, which is part of our full strategy, um, is where we are investing in uh, continuous professional development for our for our senior leaders, both police officers and police staff. So we're doing some focused activity over the next 12 months at that exec uh, level, whilst also we're part of the College of Policing, uh, we're working with the College of Policing to pilot their new leadership uh, training um, through all of our first and second line leaders for both police officers and police staff. And then when our, our exec leaders are um, highlighted as being ready to go to the uh, Senior Police National Assessment Centre. We then do wrap additional support around those individuals um, for them to progress into uh, into the SPNAC, as it's called. Um, but I suppose the other comment around Chief Officers, obviously the pool doesn't just come from Merseyside because at chief officer level you do see the movement across um, across forces. So whilst we have a pipeline of people coming through that middle uh, leadership, through into the exec, through into chief officer, obviously we work, we're part of the national position around providing mentoring schemes, coaching schemes for those exec levels nationally as well. Great, thank you. Um, is there anything else that my colleagues want to ask? Anything else? No? Okay, great, thank you. Move on then to Uplift. So just to, I guess, give clarity for public, Operation Uplift is uh, what the, um, is the term used to describe the increase in police officers that have been funded by um, government recently. So this is to look at where those specific officers have been um, recruited and where they're going. Chief Constable? So we, um, we think we will be allocated, as it says on the slide there, around 667 of the, um, of the 20,000. Um, as I said earlier, it was that those 667 needed to be recruited over, it was a three and a half year period, so year one was actually effectively 18 months. We made the decision as a force to go early, so we will recruit all of our allocation um, within two and a half years. So by the end of 2022, we will have recruited that full 667. And you can see on the slide there that um, we were already recruited 500 of that 667. So a really positive picture for the communities of Merseyside in terms of we've gone early. Um, and so our communities will see the number of officers um, out on the, on the streets and available for deployment sooner than the operation, the national operation um, uplift target. Uh, Matt? And I just support that further to say that we also uh, include and uh, the additional officers to that Uplift provides is concurrent to our attrition levels as well. So um, we are forecasting and taking advantage of Operation Uplift as well for our communities. Good news. I have to say that in terms of the people services team, um, you know, it's created a huge amount of demand, very positive. Um, to get the people in, then they have done an absolutely brilliant job in terms of um, recruitment or, uh, you know, advertising, recruitment, getting people through the system and then getting people into the acad academy. And the people in the academy um, did amazing work during COVID to make sure that we could still provide a level of service to our recruits and deliver as much of the training uh, flexibly, uh, sorry, deliver as much of the training in person 
Um, we saw flexibility from Liverpool John Moore's University as well to provide face-to-face -face training when universities were doing everything online to make sure that we'd got that quality of, of training being delivered um, to those new recruits, which was really important because of the volume of um, new recruits we've got coming into the organisation. But, uh, you know, they, they split, um, we, we, we train in the, we, we split shifts now, so we train in the morning and in the afternoon uh, to make sure that we can maximise the estate to maximise those, those number of recruits coming, coming through. So depending on the entry route, the training uh, journey of new recruits does vary. Um, and the table shows the uh, the maps, the entry dates of the new recruits and then their current status in the journey to becoming a substantive police officer. Um, on the first tranche of officers uh, recruited during the uplifts period, five cohorts have completed their training and have been deployed across emergency response, local policing and investigation. Uh, the remaining new recruits are at various stages of their training journey and will mature into substantive police officers over the coming months and years. Um, once commencing training, the DHEB students, uh, officers, uh, will not be ready for posting until uh, 20, month 23, whereas the PCDA students, they're not ready for posting until month 36. Sorry, Louise, can you just explain the acronyms so that people understand what the different routes are? Do you want me to do that? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, PCDA is the Police Constable Degree Apprenticeship. So this is where um, people can come in and do a degree apprenticeship with us for three years. At the end of that, they will um, have a degree qualification. So they don't need a degree to join and join that scheme. Uh, they only need um, a level two qualification to do that. Um, and then the DHEP is the, um, I'm saying that now, it's the, the, the diploma, but when the degree holder, um, so that's where they've got a degree, they come in, they do a two-year training programme after completing a degree in, in any subject. And if we'll dip? That's the initial police learning development programme. And is that the old? That was the old it? system uh, that had no degree okay. attached to it, either through learning or on entry. So one of the concerns I have around, while I appreciate you only need a level two to come in, a degree can be off-putting for a lot of people because of you know the academic requirements and things like that. Have you got any sense as to whether that's affected the type of individuals who have been applying or getting through the process, or you know, to me in terms of, and then who you get at the end of that? So I think of it as a I think of it as a positive because what we've done in Merseyside, our entry requirements are lower than other forces. So um, other forces have gone with a level two. So if we talk in terms of GCSEs and A levels, level two is you only need maths and English GCSE level four or a grade C under old money to apply to come and be the degree apprenticeship. Whereas other forces have gone with a level three qualification, which is an A level qualification. We wanted to make sure that we were able to recruit from as broader and diverse pool as possible across Merseyside and, you know, potentially outside of Merseyside, which is why we went for the level two qualification. What we recognised to come in with a level two qualification and then complete a degree could be quite a challenge. John Moores have worked with us and we make sure that through that three year programme, there's additional support for people who may struggle academically to complete those elements of of that degree. It formalises the training that police officers have always had through the IFL DIFL programme, but came out with no qualification other than to say they'd completed their probation. There is a higher element of, uh, of academic work, but for me, I think it's really positive because I think it provides an opportunity for members of our community who may never have felt that they could aspire to be a degree holder to actually get an academic um, qualification because the um, so they they you know become a police officer, but they also achieve um, a, a degree at, at the end of it. Um, so I you know think there's an opportunity there for us to really change the aspiration of some of our communities, our individuals, and our families, and our communities who may never have thought about having um, a degree, but we do put the additional support in. And I don't know if there's anything in addition. Um, I just support what the Chief Constable said. It also onwardly, I mean, it is still early days uh, regarding its introduction, but also 
uh, its onward use to policing and, more importantly, our communities. The new officers who complete the degree programme will continue their learning uh, journey throughout their service and will be contributing towards our evidence base nationally and locally. Um, so it's a fantastic opportunity and beneficial to our communities and individuals. Um, okay, thank you. Um, and um, apologies because you might not know this off the top of your head. Do you have any sense? Do you know how many people applied um, to get to that four fifteen that we've got there? Do you have any sense of was it was it will we overwhelmed by applications? I guess what I'm asking in terms of it being a, a popular career choice. Well, we're still uh, we're not struggling to recruit in terms of every time we open the uh, recruitment gates, we still have you know a, we, lots of applications. So over a thousand applications each time we open the uh, application gates, and then obviously. There's then various st stages to go through through recruitment, so it is certainly not um, it's not putting anybody off. I, I, you know, we will come to it later in terms of all the work that we're doing to make sure that we continue to recruit from that broad pool. So this uh, slide shows the student officer exit interviews. Uh, we have. Um, 15 leavers, which we've got some information around the, the reason for leaving. Uh, six of those leavers cited a wrong career choice, two uh, around leaving around personal circumstances, and two failed to meet the requirements of the role. And you can see the leavers um, are, you know, when you get into the double figures of two, three, and four, are predominantly aged 22. Um, or uh, 24, 26 years old. This uh, slide shows the diversity breakdown uh, captured against each financial year. Um, the financial year 1920 includes approximately 30 candidates from the April and May intakes, which, which were not part of uplift funding. In terms of uh, the local with projected, projected characteristics, this does not account for intersectionality. So individuals with more than one list of projected characteristics will be accounted for multiple times in the total. Um, you can see there, April dip, we've got a total recruited 357, and of that 33.6 of those uh, were female. With it, the PCDA and the DHEP financial year 2020 to 2021, a total recruitment of 417, uh, when you've got 38% of those are female. Um, and then 20 financial year 21, 22, so the PCDA and the DHEP so far, there's 82 recruited in there, 42.7 uh, female. Um, and you can see uh, seven at the AME, LGBT plus and disability are lower numbers there. So uh, one of the questions we had from the, the public, um, and my own question was around particularly that diversity in terms of um, BME uh, recruitment. <clears throat> so it's helpful that you've got that there. And obviously it does look like it is going up in terms of the cohorts, which is positive. Um, do you break that down further than, um, so rather than just BAME, but in terms of black um recruit specifically and apologies if you're going to come to it uh, yes we do in on our systems we do yeah okay yeah yeah we do we do capture capture that uh information um it's not just uh one group of people uh i can give you some examples commissioner uh, the 19 to 20 intakes of the six black asian and minority ethnic uh, individuals too identified as mixed or multiple ethnic groups, uh, white and black Af African, um, and one identified as mixed, multiple ethnic groups, uh, white and black African too. Um, the latest information we have, uh, so for the financial year 2021 to 22, uh, we've, we've had seven black, Asian and minority ethnic candidates, two who have identified as black, um, and then um, one as mixed, uh, white, black, and Caribbean. Um, that, that's the type of data that we are collecting, so we are uh, refining uh, the different ethnicity groups uh, against applicants and workforce. Okay, 
great. And I think we're going to come on to talk about diversity in a bit more detail, so we'll, we'll pick that up there as well. Okay, so this, uh, this, uh, there's a lot of narrative on the next few slides. Um, I'll just pick out some key points. Uh, so the retention of new recruits, uh, there's a number of mechanism, mechanisms in place um, to make sure that they both as an in individual but collectively have a voice uh, through their journey um, with us. Um, and then we use that information to um, feed back into the programmes uh, particularly within the force and at John Moores University to address any challenges or blockages and make improvements where necessary to the programmes. So some of those things are listed on the board. Um, for example, a completion of an assessment of needs where that gives the officer the opportunity to feed back where they may have uh, needs that we need to support. Uh, lots of interaction between class trainers and assessors, particularly focus groups got module evaluations that are ongoing between the force and John Moores and those those are uh, written up and fed back with recommendations uh, when completed and um, we have student council and you know um, obviously things that you would expect such as one-to-one -one learning a uh, development officer and um, early intervention of students uh, tutor uh, when any issues do arise also, in addition to that, Commissioner, we've just uh, undertaken a review of our people services um, structure and we will be introducing a student manager officer as well within our academy to pick up on well-being and welfare issues to provide additional support as well. So it's, it, it's covering a whole range of aspects uh, to add to the retention of new recruits. Okay, so some of the improvements so far, we've made some changes to the programmes to uh, better suit the needs of learners in both of the uh, PCDA and DHEC programmes. Uh, ad additional protected learning time, um, the learner needs support assessment with uh, supportive measures put in place, improvements and adaptations to training plans, so a bigger focus on blended learning opportunities. Uh, we've, we have looked at our processes to make them more slicker between our people services, academy and workforce management and John Moores University. Uh, there's a joint governance improvements that we've made between the academy and John Moores and then we do focus on those attrition rates, looking at what the key issues are, the qualitative, quantitative data uh, to identify any patterns or trends. Um, given that the um, degree programme, I guess, is still relatively new, is there anything that we are learning from other kind of police areas in terms of other universities and, and higher education establishments? What are they doing in terms of adapting the degree and things like that? Yeah, we, we do link in uh, with other police forces and other universities uh, to share learning. That's a continual cycle uh, through the College of Policing as well. Um, I'd just like to add here as well the collaborative um, approach by ourselves and Liverpool John Moores University is growing daily. Um, from the daily conversation to form of structured partnership groups uh, involving both police officers who are within the system of learning lecturing staff and then uh, management across both organisations to ensure that we are given the best offer to our students and also our organisations understand any learning um, uh, to grow the partnership as well. Okay, so we, uh, the slide just outlined some of the development opportunities. So for example, a leadership framework, we have designed a framework that allows us to build on a number of learning and development opportunities uh, within different levels and stages of uh, the process um, involving blended learning and uh, encouraging that continuous improvement at all uh, ranks and grades. Uh, for the um, for the whole force that is the establishment, so the promotion pathway courses are mapped to the College of Police and Learning standards for both staff and officers, and support professional and personal development. It's currently work being undertaken with the college as part of the National Leadership Centre. Uh, we'll expand on that, and we are being recognised as best practice force. Uh, mentoring and coaching, so there's a number of qualified staff and officers with both mentoring and coaching qualifications or training that they've been through 
Uh, we've also set up mentoring course to ensure we can train and develop more mentors to support ongoing development. Uh, there's one-to-ones in the, you know, your personal development reviews. Uh, they're designed to enable people to identify how they wish to develop and advance um, and can be used by line managers to support that effectively. Uh, the new system will also assist us to identify talent and build steps uh, to develop and retain talented individuals. And then that continuous pro professional development, uh, there are central events um, set up by individual strands but frequently run by specialist areas that provide learning and development opportunities across the force. Is there anything in particular um, targeted um, for areas where you might have you know, fewer people moving up the ranks. So um, in terms of women and, you know, black officers and things like that, is there anything that's targeted particularly at those people you want to see move through the ranks? So we look at, so the uh, National Police uh, Chiefs Council, there is a toolkit for diversity, which starts off with um, attraction, moving through to recruitment. But one of the, one of the strands of that work is around progression. So both progression into specialisms but progression through uh, promotions both for police officers and police staff and through that we have absolutely have uh, programs in place for all of the protected characteristics to make sure that we are supporting individuals um, to progress through um, uh, through promotion opportunities where there is where there is a protected characteristic in place so coaching and mentoring schemes each of the strands individually tends to do um, t t tends to do their own work in terms of talent management pathways. But then, as an organisation, we also have talent management pathways in place for individuals. Max, anything? Yeah, um, and uh, just to add to that as well, we we also engage with our um, staff uh, networks who are aligned to uh, protected characteristic groups and we work on development processes and extra support with them as well. So we're, we're gathering that employee voice. Uh, there's a chief officer sponsor as well. Um, so yeah, we do, we do cater for, uh, as, you, as you discussed, black officers, females, et cetera. And, and do you monitor that as well somewhere to look at actually how many are coming through the system and you identify yeah. any problems here? Yeah, so uh, as part of our uh, data analysis around the workforce, we're looking at progression. Uh, to people, we've, we've just installed in a brand new system as well that will track talent and individual performance development, etc. So uh, it's it's full wraparound support. But at the end of every promotion process, we do assess in terms of the number of applicants from each protected group, and then the then the then the, su the su successful outcomes um, to see where else we need to focus. Okay, so moving on now then to diversity. So, you know, as discussed, this is obviously a hot topic in terms of making sure there is diversity within the police. Um, Chief Constable? So, I've, I've been clear since I've been in post that, um, you know, inclusion is one of the priorities that I've pulled out from the fourth strategy. Um, it is somewhere that we have, um, um, or I have committed to put some of the options uplift resources into both our community engagement unit and our inclusion team who work right across those strands as I've outlined from that attraction piece into recruitment through into progression and then work that we do as people want to exit the organisation understanding um, the reasons for exiting the organisation. Um, it is a priority. We have a gold group running around it. I chair the gold group as the deputy and I've carried on chairing it as the chief uh, because it is so important to, to me individually but for us as a chief officer team and as a force to make sure that we are representative of uh, the communities that we are that we are um, policing um, it straddles across two strands really so matt in terms of the people services work but also john in terms of the work that we do around community engagement to build that trust and com confidence to encourage people to come and join us um, so in terms of the data if you do want to take us through it please Thanks, Chief. The uh, diversity overview, as you can see on the slide, so I'll start at the, um, well, to my left, to top, <laughs> top left in the orange box. That's the diversity bra uh, breakdown for black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, and that's split by officer, staff, PCSOs and specials. 
So you can see there of the percentage of the total workforce, 96% uh, uh, identify as white, 1.67% uh, as mixed, um, and less than a percent of uh, Asian, black, Chinese, other. And we do have uh, a percentage there, just over 1% have not stated. Then we go into the green box, which is around sexual orientation. Um, and the numbers are split again in the same way by officers, staff and PCSOs into uh, heterosexual, uh, lesbian, gay and bisexual and then not, disclo uh, not disclosed. So you can see um, the totals there by officer and staff. In the pink box we then have the breakdown uh, for disability and this is a straight yes or no. Um, and this is about people uh, self-disclosing on systems and uh, you know various levels of disability uh, for uh, officer, staff, PCSO and specials. And then in the bigger blue box on the right hand side, this is the workforce gender profile by rank and grade. So you can see there from constable, uh, police officer, uh, right the way through to chief officer. Um, and um, when you, you're at, say, constable level, for example, 67% of, uh, of our officers are male, 33% uh, female. And then that sort of um, stays pretty similar right the way through uh, that 60-40 split. There are some, uh, slightly difference, some slight differences around that sergeant inspector level, um, but it generally follows a 60-40 split across. Uh, when then you look at the police office, the police staff, again, similar, you've got 71% um, um, of our total, um, sorry, it's not 71% of our total. We've got the double A grades there, you can see the total 203, and then that's percentage split. So 71% of that double A grade is uh, female. And then as you go through the, uh, the grades, that changes uh, some quite you know significantly in some grades and others it's fairly static so you find that predominantly those grades around D, E and F where we've got our volume and um, you've got that 50-50 split in some cases uh, but again you've got areas like the contact centre or criminal justice uh, where we've got predominantly female workforce. Um, so in terms of the percent so in terms of the um BME, and I guess in particular the black strand, only 0.37% of the total workforce. Do we know how that compares? I know you've got another slide around the figures, but do you know how that compares to the population of Merseyside? So I'll be very clear. It's not where it, it it's not where it needs it needs to be. We are not reflect we are not reflective of the communities that we're policing, which is why it's an absolute uh, priority for us. And whilst on why it is a priority for us to provide positive action for um, people with protected characteristics. So we provide that from an um, attraction perspective and from a recruitment perspective. We've got multiple initiatives ongoing through our inclusion team and through our community engagement unit to firstly, um, as I said earlier, to engage with our communities, to build that trust and confidence with our communities in Merseyside Police. So they see us initially um, to engage informally with us through our volunteer schemes, you know, our specials, our, our mini police, to when they w actually are confident enough to actually undertake a formal contract of employment with us. Now we do that for all protected characteristics, but what, what we are also very upfront around is we are, there is a priority around recruiting people from minority ethnic groups because you can see the diversity data shows us that that is where there's a problem and there's particularly a problem around recruiting um, black members of our community. So again, that's another kind of priority for us to understand. So people from a minority ethnic group have get you know get personal contact and almost their hand held right the way through that recruitment process. Our, our people with other protected characteristics also get that offer and that opportunity to walk people through and support them through that recruitment process. And the reason we do that is because we, we delve down into this data absolutely into the minutiae so we can see 
where people are dropping out in that recruitment uh, process, where the positive action is um, making a difference in that recruitment process. And we do that for white heterosexual males and white heterosexual females. And again, what you see is um, the support being provided to white heterosexual males, um, they are faring very well in our recruitment process, which is why they don't need the positive action. Whereas the people with the protected characteristics, our data and our, our analysis shows that they do need that positive action. So we have that, and that's why we're investing into those teams so that we can provide that additional capacity and support because it is such a priority, because our data shows us, as you've pointed out, we are not reflective of the communities that we're serving. So do you know whether, are there challenges with individuals getting enough applications from those communities, uh, or is it more that they're applying, but they're, they're falling out through the recruitment process, or I guess, is it a mixture of both? It's a, it's a mixture of all of them, but we absolutely track it through every stage, and we put support in um, through uh, at every stage. And if someone with a protected characteristic drops out at the application stage, we then put support in for them to, uh, to support them through the, um, the, the next time they apply. And if they, if they drop out at our search assessment, which is a national, uh, national assessment centre, we, we provide support um, and um, sessions at each of those stages to uh, support people through. But if they, if they fail, we don't just dismiss them there we keep we cut we keep them warm throughout the whole of that process matt jen i don't know if there's anything in addition you want to um encouraging signs are that over the past 12 months our black asian and minority ethnic uh, application and joiner rate has started to increase so uh, um, which is positive um we're seeing higher numbers uh, of black asian minority ethnic uh, applicants, especially for our police constable degree apprenticeship, and just to support the targeted action that we have done, we've recently uh, conducted two webinars uh, for recruitment, one for black, Asian, minority, ethnic, and one for female, and had over 150 people take part in that to continue the journey of onboarding into the organisation. Great, thank you. Um, I should say as well, we've had quite a few questions from the public around um, this area. Obviously, understandably, it's, a, it's a, a topic that people are very interested in. So we did have a question around what you're doing to increase the diversity, and I think you've, you've, um, you've reflected on that um, uh, with what you've just said there. Um, in terms of around diversity, there's a question around, um, uh, I guess, other characteristics. So in terms of how you use so the question here, specifically around using photos, um, and how do your community engagement team, the work that you're doing, um, what are you doing around other characteristics? So obviously, I think the BAME is really important, and obviously we've identified that as a key issue. What are you doing in terms of other characteristics, in terms of encouraging them to apply and, and that support, and also particularly around um, people with autism? Um, and are there any opportunities for them to gain experience and, and an opportunity to work within Merseyside Police? So I'll, t I'll take the question around uh, initially around um, our, recruit our recruitment campaign. So we uh, developed our recruitment campaign around Finding My Beat. I think it's been done within the last two years. So we have updated and modernised our recruitment campaign and refreshed it to make sure it is reflective of the members of our organisation. Um, so the officers that are shown within that recruitment campaign are all our staff. They're not just from one protected characteristic. They are right across all of the protected characteristics. Um, and we will um, uh, make sure we will we will use, we will target elements of that Find My Beat campaign when we, we're engaging with particular communities. Um, we absolutely, as I've just said, we provide a positive action to all groups with protected characteristics. It's not just uh, people from minority ethnic groups where we provide protect, uh, positive action. There is the same opportunities in terms of webinars, sessions, um, the Phoenix scheme that we apply to support people uh, to apply into the organisation. They are available to anybody with a protected characteristic. Uh, so I think that covers off uh, uh, that one. What, what was the next bit? Oh, it was specifically around autism um, and then more opportunities, but did you... Did so yeah, thank you, Chief. Yeah, we are a disability confidence employer, so we're a member of that scheme, uh, and we have offered uh, work experience attachments uh, and insight into the wider underrepresented groups uh, to replicate what we do right across the board for protected characteristics. 
Okay, great. Um, and then we also had um, an interesting uh, question from the public around um, tattoos. Um, so Merseyside Police is still one of the um, police forces that has um, fairly strict policy around um, tattoos and not having any visible tattoos. Do you have any um, thoughts around whether this will be reviewed? Uh, and obviously, you know, the, the, the person who asked the question was saying for some communities, it could be quite a, you know, break down a bit of a barrier and, you know, and, and kind of open up conversation. Um, so, yeah, any thoughts on tattoos? So it's a question I've been asked a lot as well since becoming chief uh, in April and I committed to the workforce that we will review, we will look at the tattoo policy um, in the autumn uh, and we will do that by way of, you know, consultation, um, have a look at other policies in place and, and consult on it. Great, thank you. Um, okay, let's do the final slide on this one. Commissioner, this is really just for the reading for everybody. I think it, it demonstrates very clearly some of the challenges that we've got with the population figures. So it demonstrates that 94% of the population of Merseyside, based on the mid-year 2019 estimates uh, from the Office of National Statistics, uh, show that 94% of our communities are white. Um, so that just shows you, and then you can see those lowest percentage splits across the bottom. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any other questions then in terms of diversity? Is there anything that I've missed? Yeah. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, Chief, just in, in obviously you've given your uh, commitments with regards to recruitment of people with protected char characteristics, and that's clear for everybody to see. I just wonder what retention looks like. I noticed a slide earlier regarding uplift levers was broken down in terms of gender and age. Are there any issues in that regard, retention of uh, people? Not that we've identified specifically from uh, minority ethnic groups. We, um, so through the exit interviews, you know, we are really closely studying the attrition rates from our, from our student leavers because of this being a different scheme. And we're also looking, we're part of the national scheme to look at um, the attrition rates, but we haven't yet had anything that's identified a particular protected characteristic group who is leaving because of what they have encountered once, once they've joined the organisation. But it is something we do monitor. Again, we monitor that through uh, through Matt's uh, portfolio, but I also monitor it as chair of the Gold Meeting. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Um, John, any? No? no? Okay, if we move on now then. Um, so we're moving on to vis uh, visibility, yeah. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry, sickness, sorry. My bad, it's the wrong order. Yeah, sickness, sorry, go on. Thanks, Commissioner. So this is the uh, two slides that show the sickness rate um, for uh, police officers, which is the, oh, sorry, which is the top slide, and then the, um, the top graph, and then the bottom is police staff. So for police officers, the year-to-date rate for 21-22 it's 4.3% compared to 3.9% year to date in 2020 to 2021. Uh, you can see the dotted trend line is last year's uh, monthly um, rate, and then the red, which is the all genders, you can see where that is there. And then the below um, chart is police staff, so year to date, 21, 22, 4.7, uh, which is the same year rate that we had in 2020, 2021. Uh, the monthly rate for July is 4.5 compared to 4.2 in July, so again, uh, fairly static there. Um, do we know how we compare to other um, similar forces for sickness rate? Um, we have um, sickness um, level, um, force level and national level data come out um, every 12 months. Uh, through the annual data return. Um, we haven't had a recent one um, to be able to give you. We can track in with local arrangements some data, but we're not able to share it publicly because it's not as reliable as the Home Office sort of, you know, guaranteeing that data. Um, but we, we can see that. I don't have that with me today because we haven't got any recent data. Do you have any kind of anecdotal sense as to whether we are very much comparable to other? We're not particularly an outlier in any sense from what you know. We're not, so if we, if we take it, I suppose, because if we take it back to 1920, 
we were we were not um, you know we weren't really low in terms of our sickness, and we were we weren't an outlier in terms of having uh, having uh, a high number of offices in terms of sickness. I would say we uh, our, our performance around sickness um, and well being, so offices being present in work and being well, it, it is good. It's strong. Um, and we actually saw sickness uh, remarkably improve during uh, during COVID. Uh, so I think, you know, it, I mean, it's negligible, the slight increase you've seen there. But we are in a stronger position around sickness in 21-22 than we were in 1920. Obviously, that, that, that chart doesn't show you, you there. But our sickness position has improved from 1920. And in 1920, we were in a, I would say, in a strong position. Okay, great. Um, and do we know um, why the female rate is that bit higher in police officers in particular? <clears throat> Excuse me. So just on the figures, in the 1920 figures, we were tracking around between 5.5 and 6% for sickness rate. Um, that, again, when you look at industry, it tracks around 10, 11%. Uh, so policing generally is a lot lower. And again, you can see our rate uh, this year is much lower than that 1920. When you look at the female sickness, we know that it's predominantly uh, gender-specific conditions. Um, we, there is some element of caring responsibilities that will play out in that. And then obviously you have um, some areas where we have predominantly police staff, so they'll show disproportionate levels of sickness for female officers. So things like contact centre, criminal justice units, for example. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then in terms of when individuals are um, off sick, what kind of support is there in place to support people back into work, particularly with kind of long-term and things like that? Uh, so the force has a um, uh, attendance management policy that we support individuals with. So an individual who is absent from work um, has support in terms of regular home contacts from line management. Um, Pre-COVID, that would have involved visiting those individuals at home. Um, we now uh, have been carrying out that in a different, more uh, COVID-secure way, but we'll be looking at reintroducing that to continue that support. From a um, well-being offer, um, all individuals who are absent from work for more than four weeks are referred into our occupational health unit to be provided with clinical support that's appropriate for them on an individual basis. If that uh, absence is related to mental health absence, then we um, look at a two-week referral window for people to go into that. We then look at individually managing uh, those individuals through as appropriate for their individual conditions whether that be support through in-house services or external services that we also link into. Um, we're currently going through a review of our clinical services uh, and we'll be looking at providing some different services in the future to meet the ongoing needs best of our, uh, of our officers and our staff. Okay, great. And you did touch there on mental health and one of the questions we had from the public was around um, officers suffering more than ever with mental health problems. So is there anything else in terms of what you've just said in terms of support we put in place for um, officers and staff? So we have uh, an internal therapist team uh, which will be looking at growing um, through our review and we also have access to uh, external psychological support as well for more complex cases. So we partner with organisations within the area uh, to provide support and meet capacity and demand for those uh, individuals concerned. Uh, we're also looking at how we provide immediate support in terms of uh, response to any traumatic instances that people will attend. And we'll be looking in the future as to how we can do that more robustly than we do now so that every individual officer who comes into contact has had a contact coming immediately out from our occupational health unit rather than it being from someone at the moment who, who might experience a different level of service depending on where they're based or what the day of the week might be. We're looking at how we improve that as we move forward. So just picking up, so the people strategy, as I mentioned earlier, is part of the fourth strategy. Um, and I have pulled out that as chief. One of the key priorities is around well-being. The reason I've done that is because obviously police, policing has faced one of its greatest challenges and policing through COVID 
We've got a workforce that have worked incredibly hard um, and delivered outstanding service to our communities, but we know demand is increasing as we come out of the, uh, of the lockdown restrictions. So well-being is absolutely one of my priorities. And as a team, what we're wanting to do is make sure that we move from a reactive service where we perhaps react when someone falls over to much more of a focus on well-being. So, in, you know, preventative and encouraging people to stay well. We've, we've moved our occupational health service into a, into a, a purpose-built area um, in another out of headquarters. Um, so we've now got great facilities for our, our workforce to attend. And the review that we're doing is absolutely around moving to that position of being a well-being service as opposed to an occupational health service so we can keep our workforce well and in work to make sure that we can carry on kind of putting our communities first. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions from John or Clive? You want to? No? Okay, uh, great. So is that... Okay, so now visibility. Sorry, my agenda in wrong order. Um, so visibility, I asked for this one to go on the agenda because obviously um, a big issue that came up throughout the election and since uh, taking office is around visibility of police officers. They want to see police officers out on the streets, responding to calls, all those issues. And now we are starting to see some officer numbers increase. I wanted to try and have the opportunity to have this conversation to say, well, where are you putting those officers? Obviously, you haven't got as many as you would like but to try and help the public understand, you know, how you make the decisions about where you kind of prioritise areas and things like that. Um, so, yeah, over to you. So I'll, I'll take it more generically in terms of how we how we go through that business planning cycle. So we um, do what every year what's called a force management statement. So we look at understanding our levels of demand as they are now and then forecasting four years ahead. We look at what our capability and capacity of the current workforce is and what we what we think we might need in the future to meet that changing nature of incident demand and crime demand. That That is then part of our business planning cycle where, where we look at in terms of the budget, the funding we've got available around the number of officer numbers and where we um, uh, where the priorities are, you know, set by yourself through the uh, police and crime plan through um, the Chief Constable in terms of the force strategy um, and then what those priorities are in relation to uh, resources. So over the past few years with the Operation Uplift resources and through the additional resources we've managed to put in place through the precept, there's absolutely been a, a focus on uh, neighbourhood policing, uh, proactivity, visible policing. So the majority of the precept resources and uplift resources to date have gone into those have gone into creating additional capacity in relation to uh, neighbourhood policing. So very visible and also around proactivity. So priority crime teams, our motor vehicle enforcement teams. Again, that that ha that uniformed visible presence that are there in our communities working with with local communities so that's an annual cycle that kind of starts as soon as we get into april and then we we, we work through that business planning cycle i suppose it starts at the end of the year with the budget and then we work through the uh, the business planning cycle uh john and yourself do you want me to go through the public questions or are you gonna Yeah, so certainly in terms of the, um, in terms of, we've got the slides to go on there, Louise. Um, so in terms of the, the uplift, you know, if you look at the, the uplift resources we've already invested, as the Chief said, into, uh, particularly into sort of visible um, areas, we've got a number of specialist teams, we've already created the new Kirby neighbourhood team, um, which is an area of key risk for us. Uh, and one of the very first things we did was in terms of, um, building the, the schools safe schools officers team, which was 24 officers in communities where we are going to have the best interaction with children and young people. So that's just a sort of phase one of our uh, uplift of resources. And then the further phase is that very much there'll be a focus on frontline resourcing, enhancing our community um, and neighbourhood teams, uh, and focusing on delivering um, that engagement with communities and supporting uh, preventative policing uh, agenda. Um, I think these, these slides in terms of cancelled rest days? Yeah, sorry, I'll ask the public questions now because that probably fits okay. more and then we'll come yeah. on to some of the specifics. So, yeah, so again, um, it was a popular um, 
issue for the public in terms of the questions we submitted. So there's um, there's a few different areas. Um, there's uh, one question in particular around uh, when will we see more constables on the beat engaging with young people uh, and building a rapport with the local community? Um, we've had a do you want to ask that one then? Well, so yeah, one. again, um, one of the priorities I set um, as um, on appointment to chief constable was around community engagement, which is why. Um, the commitment around the Operation Uplift resources is that we will increase the number of resources into our into our community engagement team to do exactly that around engaging through young people. But it's also that continued commitment through into into local policing, where is where it is that absolute visibility and um, building the rapport with local communities. What we're seeking to achieve with, with that through. Um, through the community engagement team and through our local policing team is making sure that we work with our communities and our partners to start to enable the communities to problem solve themselves as opposed to always being the police that interfe inter maybe intervene and consider to, to interfere so to really understand what are the priorities and the challenges that our, fa our communities are facing and how do we work together to problem solve together with our partners. We've some, seen some really great successes in Speak, in Kirby, in Liverland, and I'm really keen that we um, uh, extend that approach right across, uh, right across our communities in line with your police and crime plan as well. Do you want to, to add anything to that? Yeah, I think it's just in enhancing that, you know, we're looking at, if, if you look at what we are doing, so the focus on preventative policing, we're developing the whole preventative policing strand and our agenda to uh, get, get upstream of, of demand and stop risk manifesting itself in communities in the first place. We're investing seized criminal assets money in a, more in um, community problem solving issues, priority based and participatory budgeting. Um, We've got, as I say, a commitment to minimising our vacancies on neighbourhood teams, to ensuring that officers and staff, and it is PCSOs as well, part of those neighbourhood teams, are not abstracted unless they absolutely have to be. Um, and we've already mentioned our focus and efforts on enhancing our, our teams uh, on the ground and the people who support them to enable them to do their job as best as possible. I think as well, worth mentioning that um, all of our community teams have been through problem-solving training. And the supervisors have been through enhanced problem solving training to do that actual problem solving work in communities. We've just recently uh, reviewed and agreed a changed way of community priority setting. So what you found with our community priority setting was very much that um, we were taking a broad brush social media based approach, going to take a much more hyper local approach to be more effectively responding to issues that communities tell us are, are of concern to them, respond on a much more local basis. And, Particularly, I know in terms of children, the work that we've done around the mini police and the cadets is, is really valuable in building relationships, um, providing a recruitment pipeline, enhancing the trust that people, young people have in the police. It's been interrupted by COVID. We're very firmly getting back, um, back into that. Uh, and also some of the other work around children and young people led in communities, supported by things like the Violence Reduction Partnership. If you look at um, our interaction with children particularly, our aim is very much to stop them entering into the criminal justice system. And year on year, our arrests of children have fallen significantly. When we do arrest children, they spend less time in custody. And we can see this over a pattern of the last three years falling and falling significantly. Uh, and then when people do come into contact with the criminal justice system, investing in Operation Inclusion, which is a deferred prosecution scheme to stop it damaging life chances of children and enabling them to get back on track. And we support them in doing that. Peer-on-peer -peer mentoring in schools, for example, coming through the Violence Reduction Partnership. So a huge effort, not just in the neighbourhood policing teams, but in all of those teams that, that make up Merseyside Policing and give that supporting element to them. Um, no, that's good. That's really good to hear. I um, I had um, I've had a few meetings with some um, youth groups, youth kind of organisations around the city, and um, one of the, the messages that comes out a lot is that quite often they only ever see the police when something bad has happened. So their whole impression, a whole connection with the police is they're only there when something bad happens. And so I think if you can do all of that work, and I've seen some of the work that happened in Speak actually around that. Um, using the funds that come from criminality into some really great projects, you just change the nature of the conversation, and I think that we can't underestimate the impact of that. So that's really um, positive to hear. Um, so a couple of other public questions then, particularly around, um, I guess again, police presence. So the first one is around. Um, this is a particular concern around West Kirby, and I've been over there and done a few walks around with them with the local policing team. 
in terms of um, some of the crime and social behaviour that they're, face that they're facing at the minute, um, you know, how long it takes to maybe get um, a police to respond. Um, and I know there's been additional deployments at uh, key weekends over the summer. Um, how? So basically the key question here is around newly trained officers to the existing community team, allow them to gain experience and understanding of crime prevention and community re reassurance. So again, it's that community officer presence within areas like um, West Kirby is the question there. And then the second question which links to this is more specifically around the city centre. So again, we've seen a number of issues in the city centre um, over the last uh, few months. Uh, what's the plan in terms of resourcing the police response within the city centre as well? So I'll ask John uh, to take the, uh, the, the specifics around West Kirby, Hoy Lake City Centre in terms of our, um, our, our local policing team. But then I will also ask Rob just to come in around talking around our responses. Obviously, there's a, there's a part of the question which is linked to response times and actually what we've seen in terms of improved performance uh, over the past couple of years. And, and despite increasing demand, that improving performance around our response to emergency and priority calls. Okay, thank you. Um, I won't rehash some of the discussions we've had about our investments in neighbourhood policing. Um, picking up West Kirby and Hoylake in particular, in particular, um, there are there's a de dedicated officer and PCSOs who look after that that ne those neighbourhoods, uh, and we know they are visible and engaged with a number of community groups. Um, as I said, we're changing the way we set our community priorities to try and get a more enhanced hyperlocal response that people will feel is more responsive to their needs and concerns. Um, particularly in terms of the Wirral, though, one of the benefits of the way we structure ourselves in terms of our local policing teams is the ownership and accountability that our senior officers have in localities. Martin Earle is the superintendent in the Wirral. He's already very well engaged with a number of community groups out there, and, and indeed within the next seven days he will be meeting uh, with one of the West Kirby community groups um, to talk about some of these issues uh, in, in, in much more detail. Um, we also have in West Kirby um, and Hoylake particularly um, temporal-based operations to um, enhanced footfall during the summer months with our beach-safe operations. Uh, very responsive in terms of park safe operations because of the gathering of some young people in particular in the area which causes concerns for communities uh, and we also have a, a, the ability with our current structure to mobilize our proactive targeted teams under what we call operation vermont to provide a huge footfall of police officers ta tackling and targeting community issues and there are numerous incidences where they have been in that area responding to the concerns that the community tell us about that said, we are conscious that, obviously, that there are some concerns within the communities, and we're not turning a deaf ear to that at all, very much why Martin will be meeting with, with communities within the next seven days and continue the relationship that he already has. So, so senior officers engaging locally to uh, be accountable and to try and, and, and deal with any concerns that residents do have. Um, in terms of the city centre, we have a... Uh, a set baseline response, which is called Operation Redelman, which sees during the, the weekend evenings a set level of, of police officers um, and staff working alongside partners, particularly in terms of the full city council, city watch, and so on and so forth, and community interest groups such as Pub Watch, um, delivering uh, a safety uh, public safety operation. Uh, and that is a, an absolute baseline, and it will be enhanced according to either predicted risk or to react uh, to us reacting to risk. So, what do I mean by that? Well, we became concerned by um, safety in the nighttime economy and sexual predation uh, in the nighttime economy. So, we set up Operation Empower, funded by some of the uh, violence um, surge. Uh, money which sees officers deployed, specially trained officers deployed uh, every uh, weekend evening um, in plain clothes and in uniform, mixed, uh, to uh, identify, disrupt and tackle sexual predatory behaviour in the nighttime economy with some, some successes. Most recently then, we've seen a change in the demographic as we move out of COVID with a different kind of football and a different kind of uh, atmosphere and environment in the city centre people starting to drink um, uh, and revellers arriving earlier and for a longer duration, which means that we've in, uh, enhanced our operation with an earlier start. We've seen um, some really horrendous homophobic attacks uh, in the city centre uh, and launched Operation Cube in response to that to build community confidence and tackle the offending behaviour, which is, again, enhanced operation within the city centre. Uh, and most recently, 
um, Operation Petra tackling street robberies uh, in the city. So whereas we do have a baseline, I think what I'm trying to say is that that is a flexible approach to it. So where we predict a likely spike, because we know that in September and October there will be an increased footfall as the students return most generally, um, we will increase our resources or change our operational plan. Uh, where we uh, pick up on a change in criminal um, behaviour or risk, we will react to it as we have with Operation Cube and Operation Empower. Um, so I know there's a, a question about a specific day. Um, I won't go into the number of officers in the in the city centre on, on, on that day, but um, there is a significant um, resource deployment into the city centre. And just, just on top of that as well, the Operation Redlman Inspector, who leads that operation on our behalf, um, it also looks after the nighttime economy areas and the other local authority areas. So there is a set deployment in each of those those areas um, where we see an increased footfall, Southport, Birkenhead, St Helens, uh, Bootle, for argument's sake. Um, and, and that inspector is responsible for managing the resource deployments across them all so we can flex to an increased footfall and increased risk in any of those areas outside of Liverpool too. Great, thank you. So, if we just um, just in terms, because obviously there's a comment around the response time. So yeah. If we just ask Rob to quickly just give us a brief update. And it's on probably that. worth saying as well. I think we probably will come back to response times in a future meeting because obviously that's a big kind of concern for a lot of people. But it'd be useful to yeah, thanks. Yeah, there's two as aspects to this commission. First is the call handling, the receipt of the call. Those the, the, those performance indicators for emergency and uh, non-emergency are very high. There's a significant improvement in there, and I'll come on to why that is in a moment. But also in terms of response to calls, similarly, there's also been an increase in performance. And that's been, re been reported through the HMIC inspection. But those figures have held over the summer despite the increase in demand, which is particularly encouraging. Initially, you could have, you could have looked at it and thought, well, actually, the increase is due to that reduction in demand. But despite the big surge in demand post-COVID, um, as lockdown was released, um, the performance, thankfully, has held. Uh, one of the things worthy of mention is the um, response to calls um, target time of 10 minutes. It's an as we're aspirational with that. We push ourselves in terms of continuous improvement. Um, other parts of the country, it's 15 minutes. Um, obviously, we can sort of um, we, we, could, we can sort of transfer those that information to see what the 15 minute call is, and it's well into the 90s. It's excellent. So, so why has that taken place? I suppose there's a number of reasons why that is. And it links to many of the subjects that have been discussed during the course of this morning. The first thing is clarity of purpose. And there's a really, really strong command team. There's excellent daily governance in terms of call handling in the contact centre, but also the response to calls. Every single blockage and failure is reviewed on a daily basis. And then weekly, and through the command team meetings I hold. The next thing is leadership. We've got strong leadership. But actually, in terms of austerity, when we reduce sergeants by 10, we've put those back into response now straight away, return that level of supervision. And it links into inexperienced officers coming into response because that's generally the gateway to the organisation, as it is for many police forces. That's really important. The other thing is shift, syst shift systems as well. So, so for call handling, um, we had a shift system where um, demand and supply uh, reflected each other, but actually the supervisors, there, was, there wasn't sufficient contact with supervisors. We've changed that now. That's had an impact on morale, uh, sickness, and also the ability to those SLAs, um, service level agreements, for actually taking the call, which is extremely positive. That has also shown itself in terms of police officer shift systems. What we used to do is we used to split the blocks in two. But um, for inexperienced officers um, and generally supervisors, once those blocks to stay together as one team, one unit, we've done that. And it's extremely popular um, because it gives a chance then for transfer of skills and um, sort of, if you like, better line of sight supervision and leadership. So that's helped also. The next thing is process analysis, this idea of continuous improvement, looking to see where we've got failure demand um, in, in the organisation. And that's a continuing process in Merseyside Police. One such example is the contact to allocated project, where we're looking at scheduled incidents, how we, how we respond to them. We remove significant failure demand through that project with line of sight uh, in terms of smoothing out the processes from the receipt of call to how it's dealt with right through to investigations. Further to which, there's also an increased quality of service for the public in terms of scheduled demand. We keep the public on the phone now. They're not waiting for um, in those few incidents where there might have been a delay in terms of coming back for an appointment. We do it there and then. It's called a warm transfer process, which is hugely positive. The next thing would be something like mental health triage, obviously the difficulties in mental health. Uh, we look at high demand generators. We have the triage system where we're working with uh, clinicians to give people the best possible care in, in, in moments of, of, of most need, basically, uh, to, to make sure people have got the right pathway. Is it a police instance or, or should it go uh, by the health service? 
Um, and I think technology as well is very important, so how we're dealing with demand um, to free up um, resources. So uh, technology with single online home, what we've got using, using the um, social media, people can report things directly to the police and freeing up capacity on the 101 number. Things like that would be um, um, antisocial behaviour, which we've seen with, with them through COVID and the legislation application, and also things like firearms registry applications. And I think the next thing then uh, would be um, what we're looking at in the future. So it doesn't stop there. There's a, there's a wide scale review of response and resolution taking place now. Um, and that will probably move things back to hubs. Um, we've got four hubs at the moment. So Edge Lane, Wallasey, Kirby and Crosby. It may be we have satellite stations to improve response times yet again uh, and our service to the public. Aligned to that is also a review of fleets to make sure we've got the right driving skills and we've got the right vehicles to make sure we've got the best possible chance of getting to the public in their hour of need as quickly as possible. So it's a continuing process and it's a restless approach to uh, continuous improvements in the best sort of interest of the public. Okay, great. Um, so lots there. Um, so thank you for that. And I, I do want to come back to some of those issues, I think, because I think there's probably lots to dissect in terms of the public interest, but we'll come back to that in um, a future meeting. But broadly, it sounds positive and kind of moving in the right direction, which is what um, what we want to hear. Um, okay, was there any other... Um, th those were all the uh, public questions, weren't there? So we answered those. Um, is there anything else? Do you want to just run through these slides then? Um, I don't know who's doing these ones. Louise, are you going to talk us through some of these? Yes, Commissioner, thanks. So important to mention around keeping our visibility up is the management of uh, what we call cancelled rest days. That's when officers have their days off cancelled. Um, predominantly, you'll be glad to hear that um, that is um, planned, forecasted in advance, uh, looking at annual events, which happen uh, every year, as, as I've said. The approval of chief officers is really important to make sure that there's that level of grip over um, those cancellations. We have a force resourcing unit that attempt to effectively resource by varying duty times when necessary to account for any um, issues that we might have before we cancel people's rest days because we know how important that is. Um, we have some uh, requirements for continuity of officers. Um, sometimes we have to cancel rest days for um, special events such as entry for example especially if you're in like a specialist post um, other cancellations might happen because of exigencies of the service so emergency situations that we need to meet uh, particularly operational demands or serious incidents that happen and then obviously we have other large events so things like COP26 which will inevitably uh, require some level of cancellation because we have to contribute to any national requirements. Uh, one of the other points is around uh, police staff promotion and opportunities for police staff. This is a, a different type of process than it is for police officers who will go through the rank structure. Uh, quite often police staff are applying for specialist roles uh, with specific qualifications or specific um, expertise. Um, and again, it's, it's a challenge if you are in a specialist role to move some police staff across departments um, and promotion is therefore isn't the same. However, we do have things like the PDR system that we've mentioned before, which gives us op the opportunity to identify talent and develop individual skills. Um, we will be able to identify people's career goals and match and plan individuals career progression development that's where coaching and mentoring can come in uh, to assist that and then of course the new leadership framework that we develop and which will uh, give it a set the standard of what we require of our uh, police staff leaders in the future Uh, you asked us a question around the supervision ratios and this is uh, for the reason really you can see um, at a force level uh, the budgeted positions for constable, sergeant and inspector and then I'll just take your attention to that ser sergeant, constable sergeant ratio so at a force level that's one sergeant to every six uh, constables and then when you um, bring that out to inspector, you've got to every inspector, you've got three sergeants on average uh, and two constables. There are some caveats with that. Obviously, we're a big force um, and we've got some specialist teams where you will have a one-to-one -one because of those specialists and others where you'll have a greater um, 
range. So, for example, the constable to sergeant range for response and resolution is an average of one sergeant for every eight constables. Um, so it does vary quite a lot throughout the force. And then obviously you've got some other um, areas that don't, are not heavy with police officers. So criminal rush, justice, for example, that's not really applicable in this case because of the different levels. And again, with the, the Force Intelligence Bureau, a significant amount of specialist posts within that um, department, which makes it look slightly different with the ratio. Do we know then, obviously, you know, police forces are different, but in terms of comparing to similar forces, is this, again, pretty standard for the kind of ratios that you'd expect? Yeah. Um, and then, um, do you do something similar in terms of um, staff, in terms of, you know, senior, you know, senior managers being managed, you know what I mean? Is it, do you do similar understanding to make sure that staff aren't managing too many people and, and that kind of thing? It's one of the pieces of work that we've done over the past couple of years is, is looking at, uh, so part of looking for the savings programme is absolutely looking at the ratios of uh, the span of control and the span of leadership, whether that be you're being, uh, being line managed by a member of police staff or whether you're being li line managed by a police officer. So we talk around first and second line leaders, we talk about exec leaders and, and, and middle leaders as opposed to necessarily breaking it down like that and we look at those um, spans of control through uh, through Natalie's uh, work in CSD. Um, okay, any other questions you want to ask? Yeah, go on. Thanks, Chief. Just around um, the council rest days, obviously we had a really good update from the force earlier on in relation to occupational health support for people. I think we can all understand the impact that council rest days can have on staff and officers, particularly in a challenging and dynamic policing area like Merseyside. I just wonder if the trade unions and staff associations are involved in that decision-making process? So we always involve uh, the trade unions and the staff associate and, and, and the um, staff associations before uh, we make that decision. So it's one of the questions as chief officers when we're or, or when we're asked to cancel rest days. Um, normally, the gold in charge of that event will come to me as the chief constable uh, around authorisation to cancel rest days. But the key question is the views of of, of the, fed, the federation and the trade unions um, in terms of seeking their support. Invariably, we do have their support once we go through the, the meeting process with them and the trade unions and the Federation and the Superintendents Association are invited to those gold meetings so they've got that full understanding of what the demand is and what the threat, harm and risk is as to why we cancel those rest days. The other thing we're really um, clear around is if we have to blanket cancel rest days, which we, which we sometimes have to in planning for major events, at the earliest opportunity, we reinstate um, we reinstate those rest days as quickly as possible because we understand the impact it has for people to be able to plan caring responsibilities, but as you say, uh, around their well-being as well. Thank you for that. John, anything to add? No. Um, okay, before we move on to specialisms then, um, I'm just going to suggest we have a five-minute uh, comfort break, if that's right, because we've got a few more slides to go through. Um, are we right to pause live stream? So we'll be back. Anybody, if anyone's watching, we'll be back in five minutes. Thanks.
Oh. Slide. Sorry, Matt, in relation to training. Oh, sorry, yes, it's under the heading, isn't it? It's just, yes. Thank you. Um, so we'll cover several areas regarding our training um, approach. Uh, obviously, COVID-19 has had a significant impact on the train and delivery. Uh, and also operational uplift and increased numbers is also added to that. Uh, we've implemented our new police education qualifications framework, uh, and we've already discussed the PCDA, DHEP, P PCSO uh, recruitment. So some examples, um, availability of rooms, obviously the social distancing uh, rules that we adhere to uh, place pressure on our overall estate. Uh, reduced numbers of students in classrooms um, and often we had to uh, split uh, a single class up into two and that impacted on the number of assessors we had. Uh, we'd already mentioned earlier that we actually introduced the shift system uh, which is new um, so new students coming into and new members of our organisation would then in effect work days and late on a shift system aligned with their trainers. That gave us uh, some capacity over the estate as well. Um, we also, and we're guided as well, and in conjunction with the College of Police and then we're able to prioritise what training we could deliver. Uh, for instance, we were able to extend uh, some qualifications up to reassessment periods um, while still keeping our, our staff safe and the use of uh, the, the required skills. And then we used uh, some of our estate to actually facilitate extra training. So we've gone through a process of bringing in a new IT system um, called SmartForce that would normally be delivered at uh, the Academy at Mather Avenue and we were able to identify new estate space to create uh, socially distanced uh, IT training facilities. So uh, there was a lot of work going on. I must um, also then bring into the trainer and assessor resilience as well. So increased numbers of New officers uh, around Operation Uplift coming into the organisation means we needed more trainers. We were able to secure them um, and bring them in. And then uh, with Uplift and with the professionalisation of policing through the PEQF, we've had increased requirements for uh, qualified assessors. So we've also matched the needs of our students and people who are being assessed with increased uh, assessors and provided them with additional qualifications. Um, I mentioned earlier on a uh, really good, strong partnership and collaborative problem solving between ourselves and Liverpool uh, John Moores University. Uh, and certainly, we just before the break, we were discussing our staff associations and police federation. There was a, there's been a lot of engagement as well to ensure that we... Um, we're, we're getting the full picture around staff well-being um, and then that problem solving to ensure we're still delivering uh, suitably qualified officers and staff uh, for delivering our community first strategy. Um, there has been a fantastic amount of work uh, been conducted by teams in the academy to actually deliver uh, high quality training uh, through the pandemic. It's been extremely challenging and something that they've met uh, really well. Okay, next slide, please. Thanks, Louise. Um, and then we look at the overall quality of training. So one thing that we've done, uh, it's quite unique to Merseyside Police, is that we didn't want to lose the face-to-face -face delivery of training. Um, we know other organisations have gone to a totally online uh, offer for training uh, and not bringing anyone into the estate. Uh, we decided against that. We have had some blended learning, but the majority of training has been face-to-face. -face. The Liverpool John Moores University side of it was online, so we were able to facilitate that uh, through good negotiation and planning. Um, and we still met all our health and safety obligations uh, and the required legislation that we've brought in. Um, we, we've ensured that the delivery of the training is being assessed as well. So we are uh, constantly checking with the students themselves that actually they understand what they're learning because it's a, it's a different environment. We've got limited group discussion, but we're still facilitating that. And we have made the best use of technology throughout. And then the delivery of non-essential training, uh, we've had to prioritise that. We've either cancelled or postponed it. 
uh, but we haven't lost it. Um, and we've had to balance that out with new students coming in and then those essential mandatory core training packages that we must deliver uh, to our organisation. In terms of doing the um, training then in, in person then, uh, obviously as much as possible, has that caused any issues for any of the trainees? Was everybody happy with kind of everything that was no, put in place? Uh, Sorry, overwhelmingly positive. Um, what that allows for uh, that the online facility doesn't is to talk in the margin to provide extra explanation as opposed to just front-loading uh, a, a subject to a class online. So that facility for um, that feedback identifying maybe a student who might not quite have grasped what the, the subject they're learning and then pick up additional learning and also the additional needs that some of our new starters require, uh, we've been able to identify them early on. Okay, thank you. Um, hugely proud of our specials and volunteers uh, and grateful and indebted to them. Um, they do uh, an incredibly good job across the piece um, without pay. They do it very much uh, as, as members of the community come, coming to give back by their service as, as either special constables or as volunteers in other roles. Um, 154 active special constables uh, at the minute. I'll just come on to the numbers um, shortly. Uh, giving us, since January of this year, over 40,000 hours of duty time, which equates to uh, approximately 40 hours um, per month per officer. Now, if, if you think of that in terms of what that equates to in terms of a regular officer, you can see how well it gives us a force multiplier. Uh, and those special constables are split between uh, a number of uh, strands within the force. They're not all in, in local policing. Approximately half sit within the local policing strand. The rest through other areas, including matrix uh, response and investigations, providing us either specialist support because of their specialist background and skills or more generalist support, giving us those force multiplier hours. We'd like to have our establishment uh, at uh, or above the 200 mark. Um, it's been challenging to do that through uh, COVID um, with recruitment. Um, also, a big part of our demographic is we recruit from students um, quite a lot. And we get a lot of success recruiting from students, which is great because we get young and enthusiastic people, some of whom end up joining the police. Um, but it does mean that every three to four years we have a churn in terms of some of our experience moving on elsewhere uh, as they further their, their lives. Uh, and, of course, that's impacted our ability to recruit in during COVID. And you've got to balance that with our police officer recruitment enhanced under Operation um, Uplift. Um, we just move on to the next slide, please. I think that probably details um, uh, much of, of which I've, I've discussed there. But what we do get is an unerring enthusiasm from our special constables um, working either together as part of the task force at the weekend or working with a variety of the uh, different departments and teams throughout the force. Um, their contributions recognised extensively internally, but worthy of note that we've been successful at the Lord Ferrers Awards, which are the National Special uh, Specials Awards over the last three years, um, in a variety of categories, recognising some of the outstanding contributions made by some of our special constables and officers. So um, really proud of what we've got. We'd like more in terms of numbers because that tends to give us really enthusiastic, enthusiastic people out there serving communities in the most visible of roles. Perhaps we can move to the next one on volunteers. Um, specials are probably the most visible type of volunteer we've got, but that lists out the fact we've got many others, some of us supporting us in public-facing roles, such as in inquiry officers, statement-taking, supporting coronial services. Um, we're not forgetting our cadets, neighbourhood watch, um, uh, some of our, our safer schools um, officers and the support that they get from volunteers who help us develop our, our programme, uh, mini police, the police band, uh, for example. So um, volunteering again, something else we want to uh, expand uh, as we move forward and come out of COVID, real opportunity to do that. And we invest heavily in the force in terms of our citizens and policing department, which sits alongside community engagement, um, inspector-led team, uh, answerable to uh, the, the CEU command. But actually, that then puts some dedicated people who are dedicated to recruiting, developing and supporting our volunteers and special constables, ensuring they get the best out of their experience with Merseyside Police 
and ensuring then that that translates for us into the best possible service to communities. So uh, all in all, work that we want to develop um, uh, and also um, uh, sort of something that we're really proud of. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any, any particular questions on that, Commissioner. Um, yeah, so um, our specials are fantastic. Um, I've met with a few of them um, over the years and they do a brilliant job, as you say, for no pay. So they're absolutely fantastic. How do we view them, I guess, as the police in terms of, in an ideal world, you would have a fully funded police force that wouldn't need specials in terms of, wouldn't rely on volunteers to be able to do what needs to be done. So how do you manage in terms of where they go, what support they offer so it's very much additional and it's not... You don't become reliant on volunteers to offer what is an you know an essential core service for the public, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I think um, you know you can't rely on on specials um, to provide that core service because they do have things that crop up in their lives that sometimes mean they have to change their duties. Although uh, we are very much blessed with people who tend to turn up when they say they're going to turn up and give us the support we can plan on. So what we do is we use them as force multipliers. We don't fill any regular posts or base any of our our resource modelling on the availability of special constables. They're used as additionality into the teams that I listed before. Um, when we have operations that involve um, the deployment of significant numbers of special constables, they are all operations that enhance and give additionality to planned policing operations. Uh, and we will invest regular officers to work with them. So particular within the special constables, we have a constable and a sergeant post sitting within our citizens and policing team who work with our special constables to train, develop, plan the operations, deploy with them to support them alongside their own supervision uh, and ensure we get the absolute best out of it. But there is um, very much this is additionality uh, and what we don't do ever is uh, move away from our planned our, um, core commitments and leave mm -hmm. that to special constables. They give us additionality. They are on top of our city centre policing operation. They provide us additional resource tackling antisocial behaviour hotspots at the weekends and they come and put an extra body in a car um, that would otherwise have been singly crewed rather than that, assuming that will be one of our doubly crewed vehicles, for example. Great. Um, and obviously in terms of the, the vacancies then, obviously they have dropped off a little bit over the last couple of years in terms of the numbers of specials. Um, are we seeing many of them join... Um, well, I guess the question is, do we know where they're going? And I'm assuming a number of them have joined to become, you know, part of the, I don't know what the technical term is, paid constables, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, very much so. Um, certainly, um, I, I, within the last two years, um, entry requirements needed you to have had some kind of service with either specials or some kind of relationship with policing before joining the police. Not the case now, but we still see significant numbers of our special constables when they do leave, leaving to join the police as regulars. Of course, we do have some who move on because of the student population, particularly that we recruit from as well. Some of them join Merseyside Police, some of them join uh, other forces. Uh, it's always dismaying to hear people who, who, who when, when we swear them in, who we know they're going to apply to other forces in the northwest region at the end of their time. But it's still for us to give them the best possible experience of policing uh, in the start of their career, in the start of their journey. Okay, great. Uh, I think there's one more slide on this one. Yeah, this, this again is, is part of the, the observer scheme or the ride-along scheme is, is very much something that we've seen in action in, in other forces, very much part of our commitment to uh, transparency, really, to opening ourselves up to, to communities, to build trust uh, in communities and narrow that trust deficit that we know exists in certain areas. Um, and to just open ourselves up to, to that informal scrutiny, really, and come and have a look at what policing does and how police officers and police staff go about their business um, in a structured way, but in a way that gives you a real open, intrusive, really, uh, opportunity to come and have a look at what we do and what we're about and the values that drive us and the challenges of, of being a police officer or a member of police staff. This is one of those schemes, again, it's been held back by covid we're really starting to accelerate this now. And what we're hoping in the back of this is that along with things like our scrutiny panels for search, for argument's sake, this will go some way to building community trust and to narrowing that trust deficit and encouraging people from a broad range of communities to actually want to come and join Merseyside Police. Great. Thank you. Um, any other questions on anything? No. Okay. If we move on now then to complaints. 
So I will walk us through these. So you can see on the slide there, that outlines the number of complaints recorded um, over the last 12 months. They sit in uh, different buckets around, um, uh, it depending on the type of complaint and the trigger that it's hit in terms of the different legislation, because we got new legislation coming in in, in 2019. Uh, if members of the public are interested, the different schedules, uh, more information is available on the website, but basically a non-schedule three, let's start with schedule three, um, that is something that we must, it's defined that we must record and must investigate. A non-schedule three is something where we would consider it an early intervention, so a member of the public makes a complaint um, and we can we can learn from it. Uh, uh, and um, I say that's why it's classified as a, a early intervention. And then I say 2019 is the is the change in legislation. Uh, we tend to record um, about 182 complaints um, per month. Um, the majority of our complaints are logged as non-schedule three. Um, around 87% are logged as that. Uh, a number of them then do flip over into a schedule three if we can't uh, early intervene with the member of the public and it then flips into being a schedule three. On the next slide, you can see the different breakdowns of the different types of complaints uh, in terms of the different buckets that they, they come in. We very much uh, consider ourselves a learning organisation, so absolutely uh, learning from those complaints, especially the early intervention type, where even when an allegation uh, is resolved, um, there may be in learning for the individual, so that will be managed through their PDR with their line manager, or organisational learning where we look for trends and themes and build it in, into our, our training programme. So it comes into our, into I suppose our wider bucket of um, organisational learning. And John just mentioned the scrutiny panels there, and how do we pick up on those things from members of our community that that informal and formal feedback, as our complaints are, to make sure that we are adaptive and flexible to that feedback from members, um, members of our community. So we record through our professional standards department the items of learning that were identified from our complaints. Okay, great, thank you. Um, in terms of that slide there then, so there seems to be quite a lot of duplication. What's the difference between no further action and not resolved, not for, no further action, for example? Um, without knowing the specific cases, I, I would just be, I, I kind of would be more guessing in terms of, um, I'm guessing that we didn't manage to, on the not resolve, we didn't manage to resolve it to where the member of the community was happy with the action, but there was nothing further that could be done around it because it was, it will have been a piece of policy or a piece of legislation. The example springs to mind. We saw a slight increase in complaints around COVID uh, in terms of us um, applying the COVID legislation, which clearly was our role to do. We were never going to be able to resolve that with a member of the community because we were enforcing legislation uh, in line with, it, with COVID regs. So on the, that, that's where we get that. There's no further we can take with that complaint, so it would be NFA, but we haven't managed to resolve it from the customer's perspective. Um, um, regulation 41, do we know what that is? No. Okay, if we can double check that one. Um, and in terms of what's coming out of the complaints, are there any particular um, themes or kind of areas that are kind of we're seeing patterns of, of complaints coming through around or any particular piece of legislation that is, is bothering people that we're getting stuck up against? So there's not particular bits of legislation other than I've just mentioned uh, COVID. What we do is we look um, through the uh, performance management governance, through professional standards, we look at if there are individual officers in relation to consistent uh, or any consistent themes, which will be managed on a one-to-one -one basis. And then we also look at organisational uh, themes that we might need to consider uh, around our, our training. There isn't particularly anything uh, that's um, consistent uh, where we've needed to massively uh, change our um, change our, our uh, training. Our, our, the big one tends to be incivility, which is picked up in relation to training right from day one, reinforcement through uh, standards and values of the organisation um, right throughout. But I would say that's the only one. 
Um, and then in terms of, and again, I know there'll be limits around the data on this, but in terms of how we compare to other police forces, in terms of numbers of complaints and percentages that's resolved and things, do we compare to our knowledge in terms of other similar forces? We don't have access to that. Do we we don't have access to that data. What okay. we do do is we do have um, regional networks, so our heads of professional standards do come together and we make sure in terms of the, the, this kind of standardisation, levels of understanding, themes, that that's done on an informal basis as opposed to a formal basis. Right. Okay, thanks. Um, anything else you want to add? No? Okay, thank you for that. Um, right, technology. Keith, if I can ask you to take this question. Yeah, thanks, Chief Constable. Thanks, Commissioner. So I've just run through a set of slides here that will talk about how the force is looking to optimise technology-enabled um, people and places for the force and for our stakeholders and particularly the public within the finite resource envelope we've got. Also, um, taking a lot of the pandemic learning we've gone through, um, you know, and, and, you know, we're looking to speed up some of those learnings as well because we've seen great benefits. And, and I suppose the next thing really is um, we're expecting productivity and efficiency gains as a result of, of this investment in technology. So it's not just a case of doing it, it's and just for doing its sake. It's a case of making sure we get a decent return, whether that's quality, finance, um, improving for our staff, um, reduce errors so all these things are playing in so the first point of this is um, we're, we're, we're actually um, bringing in Microsoft 365 across the force and I suppose a lot of people will be used to the sort of Teams Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Outlook so familiar with those but perhaps some of the less familiar areas are things like Forms so Microsoft Forms has a survey function which will mean we can be a lot more interactive internally and, and particularly we might that, that could be extended externally as well We'll have SharePoint as well, which will mean we can work on the same files at the same time. That reduces, in particular, duplication and lots of multiple files clogging up our, um, our, our infrastructure. We also have Stream, which is coming on as well, which will mean we can share content around the force a lot quicker, and, and people can see that. Um, it's a lot more interactive. And then there's Sway, Microsoft Sway, which is um, an advanced sort of form of presentation so um, everyone's obviously seen, you know, the various um, sort of forms that have been out. Um, PowerPoint in particular is a favoured one. But this goes a lot more advanced and that, a lot more interactive um, rather than sort of, this, as you might do, there's, there's been the death by PowerPoint. That shouldn't really happen with this because it is a lot more interactive. So I'll just stop there for uh, any questions. Okay, and I suppose the important thing is... is we, we'll have most of the infrastructure implemented by November this year, and then after that, we'll start to uh, work on, on pulling out the efficiencies and the productivity gains we expect to see as part of this as well. Okay, so we've um, recently created uh, a new digital portfolio, which um, is led by uh, a chief superintendent and reports to the deputy chief constable. It's aligned very closely to ICT, which is within my, my areas. Uh, the purpose is really to improve efficiency and effectiveness across the policing. There's going to be a thematic um, approach to this across intelligence investigations, engagement uh, with the public in particular, criminal justice and frontline policing. We want people to be a lot more linked up together. We want ideas coming from, from all areas of the police and outside of how we can improve policing through using digital. We're also focusing on agile working as well, but that doesn't just mean, um, as people might understand it, working from home, things like that. This is work across multiple bases, people being able to access technology at any time they want to, at any place, with any people. So we can optimise the position um, and, and make sure our, our force is, is really as, as up-to-date as possible with everything that's happening. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, and apologies because it probably was relevant to the last slide as well, in terms of the um, investment that we're putting into it in terms of the budget, are we kind of happy that the, the, the um, investment that we're going to put in will kind of come to provide some of those efficiencies in the long term then? In terms of yeah, how we, we managed it? yeah, thanks, Commissioner. We, we expect to see a number of productivity and efficiency gains from this. Some of it will be cash releasing, as we might say. Some of it will be about getting um, more activity, um, getting through more areas of work 
than previously we, we could do before. It's also about people working better together as well. Uh, you know, so co-working, um, co-location, collaborations. We expect to see improvements across those areas as well. It's not just about getting something back in pennies as well as, as, as much as that is a consideration. Um, it's also about getting, us, getting the job done better. Um, and I assume the kind of unions and associations are all involved in some of the Yes, absolutely. Well. They, they, they've taken through this journey and, and any decision making that we do as part of Agile in particular and, it will, and the digital um, agenda will be done alongside, working alongside um, union and, and staff side colleagues. Thank you. So on, on our estate, which, which is important, you know, it's important for people to base. And, and as much as we're, you know, in a future agile environment, uh, we might need as, as many premises. What we do need are premises that are more digitally enabled and, and more um, open to technology changes. People may have heard of the term smart, smart estate. Uh, and, and what we're looking by there is we're looking to have communications around our state a lot stronger, a lot more state of the art, um, but not a, a cost sort of, uh, you know, impact that, that would be uh, prohibit, prohibited in normal terms. So we're looking to really maximise everything we can do in, in a much cleverer way. We're, um, the areas we've worked on um, since the sort of austerity came in, the austerity challenges meant that we've, we've really significantly reduced the um, number of old estates because they were inefficient, and we've, we've made improvements and built and, um, and refurbished um, estates that required that and we felt was in the right location. We've also made sure that we bring through new technologies in so much of solar, um, energy efficient windows. Um, we've also looked to reduce maintenance issues by having stronger, more robust items. Um, for example, um, even sort of energy efficient doors that close and things like that. So, you know, all the time we're looking at what we can do, but even within the cost envelope that we've been set as well, trying to use that as effectively as possible. The other thing is really to look at partner location as well, collaboration. So we've opened a number of um, um, community stations, working with partners such as local councils, um, where we uh, felt it's necessary to put a local policing presence as well. Um, I think just for the benefit of um, any public watching as well, it's probably worth highlighting that estates is one of the areas that falls within my uh, remit as well. So we have a very robust policy, uh, process in place so that when um, the police want to make decisions around um, buildings and investment and those kind of issues, it very much comes to me to sign off as part of the um, responsibilities responsibility I have as police commissioner. So just, I guess, to reassure the public that there is a kind of a strong, robust process for some of those estates decisions as well. Um, thanks, Keith. Thank you, Commissioner. So turning to um, sustainability within the estate, and it's, it, as part of the, um, the force challenge since 2010, we've managed to reduce our, um, our, our impact on the estate on carbon footprint by 39%, which is above the target that we set at 34%. So we've done very well on that, but that's not a case of you know, job done. It's, it's to us really, it's the only start, start of the journey um, into improving our sustainability. For example, all new buildings now are getting solar panels fitted where it's appropriate and, 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 and available. We're also looking at high, you know, we employ high-tech heating and ventilation techniques and, and, um, and engineering to make sure that we have um, rooms fit at the right temperatures at the right time. We're also looking to improve the electric vehicle um, options across, and, and we know that there's a significant challenge uh, within policing to, um, to get our vehicle range um, in place for the 2030 legislation. Uh, that, that, that doesn't mean we can suddenly go on to an electric fleet, you know, in the next few years or something, because that, the costs would pro prohibit that. But we're looking to it in a gradual process way, as well as also improving the uh, electric charge points that we require, because they take a lot of electricity, um, and we need to make sure they're in the appropriate places as well, and, and people are used to using those. And we we'll continue to look at, um, for example, the United Nations Sustainability Challenge. So we're signing up, we're looking to sign up to that, uh, as well as joining in some of the national collaborations that are going on within policing to reduce carbon footprint. Um, in terms of the people element of that, are we doing work with, you know, officers and staff around behaviour change and, you know, not leaving cars idling or while, you know, albeit I know there's times when I have to. Um, or, you know, turning computer screens off, those kind of little things that we know can add to some of the sustainability challenges. 
Yeah, we, we, we employ a sort of view on this as, as a war on waste, um, and as well as those items you've just talked about, sort of education, because it's not just a case of putting a poster up and expecting people to do that. You know, it's, it's, it's supervisors going around making sure items are turned off and, and, and things like that, but also um, it's, it's, it's getting people to come up with ideas as well. So, you know, we want people within the force to come up with ideas of how we can reduce that. And we have um, a, a savings board that uh, funnels through our ideas from the force, um, particular examples of where we can, we can uh, reduce our carbon footprint. Um, and, that, and that's particularly important as well. OK, and then the, uh, the final slide, it really, I talked about smart estate before. But we, we believe it can um, really f um, help and facilitate us putting the right people at the right time and the right place. And, and we believe it really links um, to, to providing more appropriate focus um, on, on policing, but also maximising efficiency and, and really helping to control costs as well. So we, we see this as being an absolute uh, priority for us in, in that we'll get benefits out of it as, as not just financial, but also from our staff who, who use these facilities, visitors, and also the public who, who need to engage with us as well. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions, John? Thanks, Keith. Um, in terms of the, our current estate, there's one chart there, which is a space not in use, and 5% of Merseyside's estate is not in use, which is above the average of 4%. Just expand on that, please. Yeah, so that, that, that relates to some of the areas, and I've just talked about the fact that we've needed to reduce some of the older premises that, that aren't as, as efficient um, and we can't utilise the space um, as, as much. So, you know, that point really is, is that's something we continue to focus on. We want to reduce that really down to zero. Smart estate, we think, will help us with that one. But also that will, that will also need um, this, our, our continued updating of our estate as well. Um, in, a, in order to do that, because we can't just, even in the best intentions, some of the older estate just isn't fit for purpose anymore, and therefore we have to look at what we do with that um, to make sure we're more efficient and reduce that down. The target is to get it down to zero, um, and in the ideal world, that's where we want to go towards. Okay, thank you. Anything you want to add now? Okay. I think that's the last um, slide then, isn't it? So that um, concludes the kind of formal items on the agenda. Um, are there, is there any other business that we need to discuss? Anything? No? No? Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, for your attendance. Um, so this was obviously the first one we did that was live streamed and with public questions and in this style and format. Um, so if anyone watching has any feedback around how useful they found it or not, please do get in touch because I'm keen that this is a useful forum for the public to see um, the work that the police are doing. Um, so please do get in touch. Our next meeting is going to be uh, Tuesday the 30th of November. Uh, there will be more information going out in terms of what theme we'll be focusing on for that and it will be likely something coming out of my police and crime plan which will be published uh, by the next meeting and equally we'll also be asking for more public questions so um, keep an eye on the social media and we will